in wave mechanics, classical. Uh, and if you call matter waves wave packets, then it resolves the fact that all particles travel with wave, uh, have an associated wave uh, as well. And in order to describe wave packets, there are basically two terms that are important. There is phase velocity and group velocity. Phase velocity is the velocity of the component. We, each component wave, so every wave packet is associated with a group of phase velocities. And a group velocity is basically the velocity of the envelope. Okay. So let's say, okay, I will not go into the details of this. Uh, the other component is light, the so particle nature of light. Uh, this is even, uh, this is sort of more difficult from for the one to view of quantum mechanics. Um, so light, if light is never matter, so that is, that is not true. So a particle behaves as a wave, that's true. Uh, not entirely again, but light is uh, never an object, it's never an object, so it can never be converted to an entirely classical particle, but its interaction with matter is sometimes object-like or particle-like and sometimes wave-like, depending on what it interacts with. Again, you see in quantum mechanics, the uh, measurement part or interaction part is the most important thing. So you have to sort of change your point of view when you're dealing with quantum mechanics that um, it's your measurement and how you measure it uh, that you will get certain answers. Like you will, uh, depending on So, uh, so it's the phenomena that is that tells you the nature of the system. If you try to think of, okay, I am not measuring, but what is going on in the system? Let's imagine. Uh, that is an unanswerable question. Uh, so that is where uh, we all, all always falter because we're always used to thinking of reality. But this is... A, Quantum mechanics is more a perception of reality. A little more about light. So if I want to treat uh, light quantum mechanically, what does it mean? Uh, treating light quantum mechanically means that the electromagnetic field is quantized and the electromagnetic field consists of discrete energy parcels and these are called photons. Uh, so this is a quantum mechanical treatment of light, uh, which is basically in the realm of QED, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, so here I should mention, so quantum mechanics is just a framework. Okay, it, it is not a theory of anything per se. It just tells you how to think about things. Uh, then uh, Schrodinger gives us the wave equations for particles. So you will see that when when you uh, take a course in quantum mechanics, we always keep saying wave function for a particle, wave function for a particle. You never say, or a particle wave function does this, and a particle wave function does that. Uh, it's never just a wave function does that, because a wave function can also be of light, for example. And then uh, not everything that we all the all the assumptions and requirements that we apply to wave functions when we solve the Schrodinger equation, they are not applicable entirely to light because light is then uh, follows the equations of quantum electrodynamics. That's the different theory. So uh, I just wanted to tell you that, that light in quantum mechanics, uh, what we mostly do is treated classically or semi-classically. But um, a full quantum theory of light is an entirely different thing. And if you wanted to treat both light and uh, a system quantum mechanically, you would have to solve quantum electrodynamics equations. And this is not an entire, it's still a field, active field of research and you don't, it's not a standard procedure. Okay. Just wanted to mention that. Because uh, you see that qubits are also sometimes made of uh, photons, etc., and then it's a different theory altogether. Uh, so at this point, maybe I tell you uh, that qubits, uh, 
depending on how they are realized. So people would design qubits in different ways. The theories that govern them, the, the actual real, realization of the qubit, they are entirely different. So if, if it's made of photons, then they're dealing with QED. If we are dealing with atoms, then it's uh, quantum mechanics uh, or Schrodinger picture. If you're dealing with uh, superconducting circuits, these are classical objects, but they mimic qubits, uh, mimic quantum behavior, okay? So the theories that govern these things are entirely distinct, which is why when you learn about quantum computing or when people will give you talks on qubits, uh, it's always an abstract system. And they tell you, okay, a qubit is two states, zero and one, which I will also go over to in a few slides. And if you try to think back to wave functions, uh, you will get confused because the underlying theories are all different in different quantum computers. Okay. And then just to summarize, difference between electrons and photons. Electrons have mass, photons are massless. Photons move at the speed of light. Electrons move at speeds less than light. Electrons have charge, photons do not. Electrons cannot be absorbed or emitted as photons. So they cannot be converted because they have charge. So if, if something is uh, charged less, the mass energy conversion works and you can, uh, you can have photons, but electrons in particular cannot be converted because it also involves the conservation of charge. Now, uh, Let's talk about the quantum representation of systems. That is the postulates of quantum mechanics. Uh, I will try to state them in a way that sort of leads up to the qubits. The postulates are not, uh, you know, carved in stone. Different books have them in different ways. Uh, with, with the large number of students, I think all of you have studied about them in different ways. But the basic concepts are, of course, the same. So the postulate one is that every physical system is associated with a complex vector space. Sometimes they're called a complex wave function, a function space. If the system is closed, which means it's not interacting, its state can be completely represented by a unit vector in this space called a state vector. Uh, you notice I say unit vector because it's a uh, normalized quantity. But this postulate does not tell us what the state it just tells you it's an existential theorem that there exists a state vector there exists the vector space uh, we need no knowledge of the interactions within the system to determine this state vector and the interactions come from our classical knowledge so there is no the quantum mechanical equation the all the classical interactions that we can think of they are collected in the Hamiltonian of the system. And Schrodinger told you that if you know the interactions of the Hamiltonian or how the energy of the energy of the system is represented, then you can solve this equation to get the wave function. The second postulate tells you about the time evolution of a closed system. Um, and this can be described by a unitary transformation. So why unitary? Because unitary transformations are the are linear transformations which are norm preserving. So it preserves the norm of the wave function. Uh, and this is a very important property of the wave function that it must be normalizable if it represents a particle. Because uh, a particle must be present somewhere in space between minus infinity and plus infinity. Okay. It has to be somewhere. You ca it cannot disappear and reappear. And this is a unitary transformation which depends upon two times. So you can evolve psi t1 to psi t2. Uh, and this is a representation in terms of discrete time steps, which is useful from the point of view of quantum computing. And I think maybe in the next talk, you will see this uh, being used. And all, uh, quant all operations on a quantum computer are in terms of unitary operators. So there's the X and they are called uh, gates in terms of uh, circuit theory. Okay. So X gate, Z gate, H is Hadamard gate, which is equivalent sort of to the uh, Hamiltonian. Sorry. 
and Schrodinger again told, told us how to evolve the system if we know the Hamiltonian. So this is Schrodinger's time-dependent equation. And then we come to the most important thing, which is also the most important from the point of view of quantum computers, is the measurements on quantum states. So postulate three tells us that a measurement onto a quantum state psi acts like a projection onto a vector from an orthonormal basis, bj, and yields the jth value with the probability uh, inner product bj psi mod square. Uh, and after measurement, psi becomes bj. So this was the uh, very surprising part of quantum mechanics. And so if a wave function is represented in, in a certain orthonormal basis, then if we uh, measure out by projecting a one of the basis vectors, you get an answer, which is uh, Cj. Uh, no, which is basically, you get an answer, which is the jth value, and the probability will give me Cj squared. You can get a number of answers each with different probability. Okay. So what is the main, main thing here? That a measurement in quantum mechanics corresponds to projecting with a known vector, projecting onto a known vector. A more general statement, which is again very important from the point of view of qubits, is that uh, these need not be individual unit vectors. You can also project onto subspaces provided they are uh, orthogonal. So let's say we have a, a space consisting of these four, uh, so these four uh, vectors. So they, are, they form a space, okay? And I construct two subspaces out of this space V1 and V2. Now, V1 and V2 are two orthogonal subspaces of V, which is the full space. And if I define a projector Pj, which projects onto Pj, so let's say P1 projects onto P1, then also I can carry out a measurement. Okay. So, uh, why can we do that? Because psi we can split up into a, a J part, so that's the part which is projected out by Pj and the part which is orthogonal to it. And then your state collapses. So psi would collapse to psi j. However, psi j is not necessarily uh, normalized. So the, uh, so the state that you actually get is not uh, psi j, but psi j prime, which is pj projected on psi divided by the norm. Now let's talk a little bit about superposition states and stationary states. So, so, so far we have not talked about uh, the dependence of psi on position or time. So typically it depends both on psi as a function of the position vector as well as time. And this is Schrodinger's time independent equation as you know it. So solutions to this uh, does not tell you the time variation of psi. Uh, this time dependent equation will tell you the uh, time dependence of psi. And the usual, okay, and the usual procedure is that you obtain all solutions, all time independent solutions from the Schrodinger equation, and you use that as a basis for psi to determine the time dependent, uh, the time dependent wave function. So a time dependent wave function is a, uh, is a superposition state by construction because it is evolving in time. So what is a stationary state? The stationary states are basically the solutions to the time independent shortening. And it can be shown that if you use these, uh, if you use, uh, let's say, and let's say we, we are forming the, uh, 
basis bj out of the solutions of the time dependent uh, independent equation then we can show that the time dependent wave function is simply a product of these solutions which are just space functions multiplied by a uh, by an exponential factor which only involves the energy of each time independent basis which is ej uh, and this and this form is basically independent of the uh, of the hamilton wave only depends upon the i energy of the states and why is it called stationary that is because as soon as you take an expectation value which means you uh, have an operator let's let's say the hamiltonian itself and you project with the same function so bj h bj the values that you get they would be independent of time because you have a complex conjugate of the time dependent so all expectation values are then independent of time for a stationary state so so here it is an important to distinguish the time evolution of a stationary state and the time uh, dependence of a superposition state so uh, if i say that so so a uh, so a stationary state of a quantum system is not static in the sense that not it's not that if nothing is moving uh, things are moving the wave function is also evolving in time but because all expectation values turn out to be time independent the physical all physical parameters are time independent in that sense it is stationary okay but and that and the time dependence you can simply add on this factor and you can know exactly how the wave function is changing in time as well however if you have a general superposition state then uh, even when the hamiltonian is time independent its time evolution is not simply a factor so there would be uh, more terms dependent on time so i think this concept will become clear if we talk about a free electron traveling with constant velocity so this was basically the system in which quantum mechanics was discovered and verified in a way so the electron diffraction the wave nature of particles Uh, Compton scattering, photoelectric effect—they all involve the electrons. However, when you try to solve the free electron problem using the Schrödinger equation, it is not as straightforward as solving a bound system. Actually, so that's because an electron moving with constant velocity is actually a superposition state, and we will see why uh, that is the case. and i want to focus on this because understanding this well is fundamental to understanding both superposition states and wave particle duality and understanding superposition states is very important for understanding qubits and how they work okay. uh, bound states are simpler and i think the biggest evidence here is all the syllabus at least in chemistry when i when it's a quantum chemistry or quantum mechanics for chemists then um, often they just ask you to teach the bound states and the free electron problem is left out of it okay but that is actually the only situation which can be verified in the sense that the electron also obeys the de broglie equation because it's a free particle it's it's simply a matter wave it obeys the de broglie equation and the wavelength of the electron obtained from the de broglie equation matches closely the experimental wavelength of the electron so we know that that is a correct equation that is applicable to the electron uh, now the schrodinger picture which will give me the wave function of the electron which by the way is absent in the de broglie description uh, that should also uh, reproduce this wave behavior that is uh, indicated by the de broglie equation right so that is that is a verifiable situation to tell us that the schrodinger's uh, uh, method of of determining wave equations is actually valid so that so we should pay some attention to it 
So I don't have time to go over the full derivation, but I will try to give you a flavor of it. Uh, the thing is, uh, so waves, just waves classically, they obey, they can be written, the wave equations can be written in these four alternative forms. See? And I've called them wave functions because I want to uh, see if these are the wave functions that are obtained from the Schrodinger equation as well. Uh, now, you know, if, if for people who have tried, uh, who've had a course, that the Schrodinger, uh, that you need to choose a form of the wave function before you solve the Schrodinger equation. And this form should sort of obey uh, as many quantum mechanical requirements as possible so that your solution uh, becomes easier, that you're closer to the solution before you actually solve the differential equation. That is the Schrodinger equation. So let's have a look at these four alternative forms to choose which one we should go with. So the, uh, so the principle that we apply here is that if they are to be wave functions, then they should be able to represent superposition states, right? So if they're just wave equations, there is no such requirement. But um, if it's to be a quantum, wave function, it should be able to represent superposition states. And in case of a free electron, uh, the two states you can think of is the particle moving left in one dimension, the particle moving left and the particle moving right. So if you try to construct the superposition states of these two uh, situations, then one and two will show you that at certain points of time, this wave function entirely disappears over all space. That cannot happen for a particle. It can happen for a light, but it cannot happen for a particle. So we discard one and two. Uh, three and four uh, both can both do this. Uh, and basically, we can choose either of them. Uh, but not both, because if you choose both, then the linear combination, again, has the same problem as one and two. So we choose, So conventionally, we just choose number three, which is this form. Then, and then we solve the uh, time independent Schrodinger equation. Like I said, that is the standard procedure. Okay. Then I get this. Uh, and then I supplement. So these are stationary states. So I know that the, uh, the, exp the time dependence will be just a multiplication of an exponential. So I've done this and I've written it in terms of the uh, angular frequency omega so that uh, it looks like a wave okay rather than just rather than as an energy okay and this is it and then i and this is a single wave constant and this is associated with a velocity which i'm calling, calling the phase velocity to avoid confusion later which is omega by k but if we look at this solution uh, and I try to normalize it, we will find that this is not normalized. The norm is infinity. So this cannot represent a particle or mass. There, we're stuck. So what is the way out? So let's see if, let's construct a superposition state using this as a basis. So it's fine if the basis is, a, so the basis is, orthogonal, but it's not orthonormal because they cannot be uh, normalized. And then I represent the general superposition state of the free electron as an integral with a continuous distribution of coefficients and this uh, infinite set of basis functions. So this, uh, so it's an integral because the wave constant can have a continuous distribution in this case. There is no, uh, and that is related to the fact that an electron can, free electron can have a continuous distribution of energy. There is no quantization of energy levels. Okay. Now, if we expand this FK about a point K0, which is let's say uh, an average wave constant at K equal to zero, we can get a solution. 
So here, uh, there are several steps and approximations, uh, all kinds of things involved before we get to the solution. Uh, I don't have time to go into that. This is basically a sort of an approximate solution. This is the leading term. Okay. No, sorry, sorry. For t equal to zero, this is fine. For t equal to t, this is an approximate solution. Okay. This is the leading term in an approximate solution. So what I want to point out is that the wave function turns out to be a product of two, uh, two parts. One that is traveling with velocity vp which is the phase velocity, if you're calling the phase velocity. And there is another sort of Gaussian looking exponential, which has a, which has a different velocity, which is called, which we're calling group velocity, which is basically the, uh, the velocity, average velocity of, a, of the superposition state. So the wave function turns out to be that of a wave path. The leading term turns out to be that of a wave. That is the interesting part. So if you take a superposition state solution of a free electron, it turns out to be a wave packet. And even more interestingly, this sort of average velocity, Vg, which we have identified as the group velocity of this wave packet, it is found to be equal to the classical velocity that you would calculate from the kinetic energy of the electron. So this, uh, the classical velocity is sort of the average uh, velocity of the free electron. So matter waves are wave packets and wave packets are by construction superposition state. So this uh, reconciles our wave particle duality problem as well. And it also tells us that the, uh, a free particle quantum mechanically cannot is not an energy eigenstate. It has a range of energies and a range of velocities, but the average value corresponds to the classical value. Okay. And then I come to the last part of my talk, the qubits. So qubit is, the, uh, and now I will go over to an abstract representation. Okay. So it, a qubit is the simplest possible quantum system. It has two eigenstates denoted by zero and one but it can exist in an infinite number of superposition states, okay? Just like in the case of the free electron. And, uh, and these superposition states are, have coefficients alpha and beta, and the sum of the squares is one. That is the normalization of the state. And if these two states are equally probable, for this quantum system, then uh, you can say that alpha is one by alpha and beta are both one by root two. Now the zero and one, they're the basis for representation of the states of a single qubit. They're just representations, you know. So they can be a ground excited state of an atom. They can be different things, just realization in terms of superconducting circuits. Uh, those are very complicated. But they're just two state quantum systems. And these two states, uh, these are called the computational basis. So that's the uh, basis in which you are representing the state when you're thinking about it. Yeah, they can be realized in many ways. Now, if you have two qubits, okay, so you have two quantum systems, each can exist in zero and one, then you can construct a, uh, a four dimensional basis, each involving different states of the qubit. So these are basis states for a two qubit system. Generalizing this for an n qubit system, you can have two to the power n basis states, each associated with some, uh, and this is the superposition state that you construct from n, an n qubit system. Uh, now you, you will hear of entanglements in the context of qubits. So what does that mean? So some states, can be simplified into a product of simpler states. So if you have a state represented in a two qubit system as this, 0, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 1, 0, plus 1, 1, you can write this as a direct product of two uh, one qubit states. In fact, the same one qubit state in this case, 1 by root 2, 0, 1, cross 1 by root 2, 0, plus 1. So this two qubit system is a direct product of two one qubit systems. So if you want to 
uh, do some operation on this two qubit state, you can separately apply your operator to the two states, to the subsystems. But this is not true all the time. So some cannot be separated. For example, a 0, 0 plus 1, 1 state. And these are called entangled states for the two qubits. Now we come to measuring a qubit, which is very, very vital because that is how you will extract your information from the quantum computer. So qubits are measured one at a time by projecting onto the computational basis. The computational basis of a qubit is determined by the measurement process. It is not an intrinsic property of the system. I will explain this uh, in, in the next slide. This is because you can be projecting onto subspaces as well. So you may have a n qubit system, but you may be projecting onto, let's say, uh, n minus d and d, two subspaces, okay, which are orthogonal. And this two, uh, and this will form your computational base. The, the ones you use for extracting information. So let's see how you will measure this qubit. Suppose your uh, system is in this state. It's a superposition state in a two qubit system. Then if I measure the first qubit, okay, then I get the answer zero okay, and nothing changes. So the state remains unchanged. If I measure the second qubit, there are two options. So the system can give me two different answers and it will do so with equal probability of 0.5. Depending on which answer I get, my system will either collapse to uh, zero or one. So which means like the second qubit will collapse to either zero or one. So my final state will either be zero, zero, or it will be zero. Let's do another one just to be clear. So if you have a 0, 0, 1, 1 state and I measured uh, the first qubit, then I can get 0 or 1 each with a probability of 0.5. And then the state will immediately collapse to either 0, 0 or 1, 1. So now when I measure the second qubit, I will get either 0 all the time, so with a probability of 1, or I will get 1 all the time. So that's with the probability of one. And, after, and this collapse state will remain unchanged by this. Now, if, I, if it's another one, let's say zero, zero plus one, zero. If I measure the first qubit, then I get either zero or one, depending on what I get. It will collapse to either zero, zero or one, zero. And then when I measure the second qubit, I will always get zero because here both these states have zero in the second. So here you see for a qubit uh, system, the sequence of measurement and the outcomes for multiple observations must be followed to understand the initial state of the system. So the sequence of measurement is important and you have to carry out multiple observations. Why is that? Because see, I'm talking about a probability of 0.5. So how will you find out that it's a probability of 0.5? You have to make multiple measurements. I mean, and you have to prepare the state and measure all the time also, because otherwise it would have collapsed. Yeah. So this measuring is very uh, tricky and important to, uh, to find out what it was all about. Now this is uh, now measuring in a different basis. So like I said, the computational basis is decided by your method of measurement. Okay? So uh, yeah, Onkon, I'll just uh, finish my talk and take your question. Uh, do you have a question right now? Ankur, uh, you can just unmute then. No, no, ma'am. You can please, you can continue. Oh, okay. So, uh, thing is fine. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, so you can be measured in a different basis. So, I have represented my state in the 0, 1 basis, but, so this is the basis in which I have represented my state, the notation in vector. And, uh, and this is another basis. Let's say now I am measuring in this basis. Then what is the thing? So my state in the zero one basis is one by root two by one by root two. Now, if I have, uh, 
if I measure in the one by root two by one by root two basis, then of course, this is exactly the same and I will get the first outcome with probability one. Okay. So this does not tell me what the answer is. This is just some value I will get with the probability one that comes from this state. And I will not get any, uh, any probability if I try to project onto this second vector. Okay. So, so when, when my state is one by root two by one by root two, if I measure in this one zero zero one computational basis, I will get two answers with equal probability. If I measure in this one by uh, this basis, the second one, then I will only get one answer with the probability of one. And then uh, finally, how do you carry out operations on qubits? So I have, I have told you how you uh, prepared a qubit, you prepared a superposition state, and uh, how you extract information from a qubit. You have to know the basis in onto which you are project projecting, okay, depending upon your measurement mechanism. And you have to know the sequence in which you are uh, dealing with each qubit in the multiple qubit basis. But this is not enough. I mean, you have to do something with the qubit, just like, you know, you add bits, you multiply bits. In case of uh, qubits, all operations have to be unitary because they are non-preserving and uh, linear operators. And quantum mechanic mechanical operators also have the same requirement that they have to be non-preserving. So this is from the point of view of quantum chemistry. So that's why it is, uh, since quantum mechanical operators are mostly unitary, uh, that's why using quantum computers for quantum chemistry is a good idea. And you will see this in the, the talks that follow today. And in order to operate on qubits, what is important is that all the Boolean case or all the uh, operations that we carry out on bits, addition, subtraction, whatever it is, yeah, they have to be represented by unitary matrices. And this is no, uh, you can do them with the Pauli spin matrices, there's the Hadamard matrix, there is the C naught case, etc. And uh, once you've represented these operations in terms of unitary matrices, you can uh, operate on qubits. So I am at the end of my uh, talk, and I, I will stop here because I don't have any more time. And I will take your questions before I. So, uh, so okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Shamita, you, uh, man, uh, Professor Shen, are you finished? Yes, I am done. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for such an engrossing lecture, um, Professor Shen. Now the uh, platform is open for questions. I think uh, Onkon Banerji, so you can ask your questions to Madam. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, yeah. I will just a basic question. Matter wave is what kind of wave? It is not mechanical, not electromagnetic wave, not transverse or not longitudinal. So how can we define the matter wave? As uh, a wave? Matter wave is basically a wave packet associated with a traveling particle. So you can think of, uh, you know, you can think of the electron traveling and it is sort of converted into a wave packet as it is traveling. So then is, is, it a quantum, is it a quantum mechanical phenomenon? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, it is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. So it's not like it's happening. It's just that it's just the way it is. The particle is a wave pattern. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. Uh, Any more questions? There are many in the chat box. Uh, I will, I will, I will take them. Uh, so, what is the physical significance of these coefficients alpha in the two basis set? Uh, uh, you mean alpha uh, acting on ket zero and beta, alpha ket zero, beta ket one? Do you, you mean this, uh, Nilesh? So the physical significance uh, is the squared value. So alpha squared will be the probability by which you get the uh, 
let's say eigen value of zero and beta square is the probability with which you will get state one they're the coefficients in the superposition that you create So let's see. So there is a Manoj. Manoj is saying, uh, is there a difference between correlated pair of particles and entangled pair of particles? Uh, yes, there is. So the a correlated pair of particles uh, is basically uh, just a fancy way of saying interacting in a way. Okay. And uh, entangled means that it is... Uh, that they're part of the same quantum system in the sense that the, the, the that certain uh, there is the certain quantities that are constant for the system as a whole do you get me so that if there are two quantum systems um, which are entangled it means that there are certain constants for the whole system which you cannot violate which means they're sort of exactly correlated you can say so entangled means exactly correlated and correlations uh, and a correlated system is something there are different extents of correlation there's less there is more and they can get uncorrelated with time uh, okay in quantum computer qubit is made of which material oh like i said it can be made of different Photons, uh, atoms, superconducting circuits. There are many multiple realizations of qubits. Okay. Yeah, I think that is all from the chat box. Okay, uh, 